The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the doors were locked, where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger into the nail marks, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, a week later, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, although the doors were locked, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and bring your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas answered him and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through this belief you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. As we begin this beautiful second Sunday of Easter, also known as Divine Mercy Sunday, keep Father Reggie in your prayers. He is earning, and deservedly so, going on a five-week vacation. <laughs> he leaves tomorrow. He's going back to, he's going back to India for, for five weeks. And so it's been a long time. Especially, could you imagine not being home for a long time and to return home triumphantly? So... So Father will be away for the next five weeks, and we'll have different priests covering on the weekends, but during the week, you just have me. I apologize. Right? So. <laughs> but Father Reggie will be, uh, be away, so pray for him, that we have a safe, and he, as he reconnects with family and friends, and you know, there's nothing like going home, amen? <laughs> when you go home, finally, he says, ah, home, it's nothing like home. So pray for Father Reggie. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, On the cover of our famous church bulletin are images from the Easter Vigil. This is past Saturday night. As where we gloriously, in the front cover of it, we have everybody that received sacraments. We baptized 21 people on the Easter Vigil. We received six people to full communion with the Catholic Church. Those were from other different denominations, but now made a profession of faith. And 14 received the strengthening of the Holy Spirit through their confirmation. So 41 people were now joined to full communion with the church. So pray for them. And I want to show you some beautiful signs and pictures of that glorious evening. And if you've ever been to the Easter Vigil, you know the Easter Vigil is not for the faint of heart. The Easter Vigil was long. It was nearly three hours especially because all those people were receiving sacraments, so it took even longer than normal. And that's, by the way, three hours. Oh, gosh, Father preaches too long. Well, no. You go to any Easter vigil in any Catholic church in the world, it averages three hours. So it's... I'm not that crazy. But it was glorious. And especially for those 21 newly baptized Christians running around Vacaville. Because now... 
Now it gets hard. Now it gets challenging. Because it's easy to start a race. You ever been to a marathon or you've been to those long races? It's always packed in the beginning. It's like, oh, everyone's happy and they're enthusiastic beginning the race. Well, when we're baptized, we're beginning the race. How many make it to the finish line? That's where the challenge now comes in. And as I told our faithful people, now, especially with the beautiful readings, as we continue to celebrate the great Easter season, now it gets hard. Jesus says in the gospel, he's speaking to the apostles here, and he says to them, as the Father has sent me, so now I'm sending you out into the world. How do you think the world will receive the message of Christianity? Fun fact. Many of you already know this. I always do this when, when we have baptism classes and I ask the parents and godparents. Out of all the 12 disciples, how many lived to old ripe age? Out of the 12, how many lived to have gray hair and wrinkles and, hate and back aches? One. One. And who was that for extra points? <laughs> the beloved apostle John, whose second letter we read today at Mass. The rest died horrible, horrible deaths. If I were to give you a homework assignment and say, hey, next time you're at Costco, I want you to go up to the first person you see and you tell them, Jesus Christ lives. What do you think they would say to you next? Presuming they're not believers. Hey, Jesus Christ lives. Well, the proper response for the other person, if they're intellectually honest, would be, well, okay, show me. And wouldn't it be a lot easier if, like in the Gospel today, where Jesus just shows up, he says, oh, you want to see Jesus? And you're standing next to the rotisserie chicken in Costco? Huh? And all of a sudden, Jesus, come, show them. Boom, and then Jesus suddenly appears, just like we have in the Gospel, shows them his hands and his side, and then we can just say, see, told you so. Wouldn't that be easier? But no. Jesus does something even harder. And that's a great question. How, how do we know this great Easter joy that we celebrate is actually true? That's a great question. Show me Jesus, and then I'll just believe. But rather, Jesus does it this way. He sends his apostles, his followers, out into the world to proclaim that Jesus Christ lives. And they did not receive that message well. When you look at the historical record of why we have any confidence at the proclamation of the early church and the apostles, was that none of the early followers of Jesus ever recanted. None of his disciples and followers ever said, You're right, Roman Empire. We were just kidding. We're lying to you. No, all of the early Christians went to their deaths proclaiming that they had seen Jesus rise from the dead, that they had seen his hands and his side, that he was raised, and that indeed, because he now lives, he was who he says he was, God in the flesh. And this is an important point, because nobody dies for a lie. The absolute consistency of the early church, of the proclamation that Jesus Christ now lives, is ambiguous. It is absolutely clear across the board. Nobody ever said we're lying or that there is his body. And when we look at the record, that's on that point alone, because there was tons of messiahs in the early church. 
that arose and said that they were the Messiah. But Christianity was the only religion which proclaimed that Christ had risen from the dead and that all of those witnesses went to their deaths. No matter what they did, none of them recanted. Which points to, again, the reality of the resurrection. Which leads to now a deeper point. Why did Jesus set it up this way? Because this fictitional person we have at Costco, whom we're talking to next to the rotisserie chicken, asks a great question. Why should they believe us? Mother Teresa famously said that joy, joy is a great net by which we can catch many fish. Now here is a key proclamation, how one way we can attract people to join that church, so that way the Easter Vigil next year will be four hours long. Oh, it will be glorious. If the Easter Vigil was four to five hours long because we have a line out the door of people wanting to get baptized through that font. Oh, I will endure a five-hour Mass to see hundreds baptized. And how do we get people to believe in this risen Jesus of ours? Through how you and I live. You see, this path is a lot harder because it requires me to change my life. It requires me to pray, to sacrifice, and it requires me to love my neighbor. The way in that beautiful readings today, when they described the early church, how they shared everything out of love for one another, the community of believers. You see, it's a lot harder for me to love you than simply to say, look, there's Jesus right here. Believe in him. Jesus, take care of him. It's a lot harder. Joy is the key to evangelize non-believers. Do we believe that Jesus is truly risen from the dead? See, it's one thing to say it, but it's one thing to believe it and to live that reality out in our lives. St. John Vianney, the great patron of parish priests, he was famous for hearing confessions. He would hear confessions. This is astonishing. He would hear confessions for 16 hours a day, back to back. I don't know how he did it. I can barely hang for an hour and a half. Right? 16 hours. And they asked Father Jean Vianney, said, what has hearing confessions, and he did this for years, by the way, what, have, what has hearing confessions taught you about the human predicament, about our human condition? Father Jean Vianney simply said, people are a lot, are a lot sadder than what they portray. People are a lot sadder than what they show out the outside. And I get it. Life is hard. But this is an opportunity. Listen now, what John says in the second reading that we heard. The victory that conquers the world is our faith. Faith, my friends, is having that utmost trust in Jesus Christ. And how does that look like in our lives? When tragedy strikes the Christian. Because just because we're Christians doesn't mean that we're freed from the pain and anxiety that comes with being alive. You see, the Christian stands because they know Christ has conquered death and sin that when tra tragedy strikes, a loved one who passes, a spouse, a child, the Christian says, even though our heart is broken, no, I have faith. Christ lives, and therefore my loved one 
I shall see them again. Or when the sinner comes to confession and receives the beauty of forgiveness. You mean I've, I've been forgiven for the most heinous act of which I can barely speak of? Yes, you're freed from that. When I'm persecuted for my faith, deny Jesus Christ, the Christian says, no, I shall believe and proclaim with my life no matter what. Or when we're challenged to change our church's teachings on whatever topic, whatever hard, no, hard topic today, the Christian says, I'll be faithful to love God and obey his commandments as John extols him. Oh, my friends, it's a lot harder now to go to Costco and to say to somebody, Jesus Christ lives, even though they say, show me, as I will show you about how I live. That's the secret, the net, by which we'll baptize, hopefully, next Easter vigil. Twice that number we did last Saturday. When Father Reggie goes home back to the state of Kerala, it's one of the states in India, it's the predominantly and only Catholic state in all of that country. It's a vibrant Catholic culture where Father Reggie comes from. You know who first planted the seeds of the Catholic faith in India? St. Thomas in the Gospel. If you go there today to India, you can go to the church of St. Thomas where his body now lies buried. India traces their lineage to their Christian faith, to the preaching of St. Thomas, whom we heard about in his doubts today. St. Thomas made it all the way from Israel all the way down to the West Coast, where Father Reggie now will go. You ask Father Reggie, how his family became Catholic, and he'll tell you from the preaching of St. Thomas. So we see how Thomas, who doubted Jesus, went to his very death all the way to India. Joy, my friends, is how we're called to live this mystery, this proclamation that Christ lives.